Hey everyone, badge makers at DEF CON and other events have been putting 2x2 add-on ports on their badges since at least 2018. This allowed other people to create their own add-ons, typically using power and ground pins to blink LEDs. In 2019, a new 2x3 port was introduced, adding even more extensibility for add-ons. The new connector exposed 3.3 in ground, I squared C pins like before, and two additional GPIO pins. The Flipper Zero is a multi tool device that can be controlled by JavaScript or C. In this video, we'll use JavaScript on the Flipper Zero to test our badge add on components. We'll interface with the memory chip, a GPIO expander, dot star LEDs, NeoPixel LEDs, and also GPIO input. Let's get started. The majority of add-ons just need power and ground. Connect pin nine, three V three on the flipper to the right top pin on the add-on. And then connect pin 11 ground on the flipper to the bottom right pin on your add-on. For an I squared C device, you also need to connect three V three and ground and then pin 15 C1 on the flipper goes to SDA, which is that top middle pin. And then pin 16 C0 on the flipper goes to SCL, which is the bottom middle pin. I'm using UFBT CLI, but you can also use lab.flipper.net and type the command I to C. You should see a pound sign indicating the address the device was found. In this example, I'm using the AT24C32 chip, which is at address 50. And not XOR published a reference design where the SAO memory tells the badge, the DC year, the maker ID, the SAO type, and custom data. Badge team uses the life format instead, where memory tells the badge the name of the SAO, along with the name and details for the SAO drivers. These drivers can be things such as NeoPixel LED configuration, OLED display configuration, along with other device configuration. This enables a badge to know how to interact with the SAO without needing prior knowledge of what the add-on supports. Let's demo the AT24C32. In apps, we'll go to scripts, and then we'll go down to the SAO underscore AT24 with SAO69. That updated my memory chip with the first protocol we saw. So we'll go ahead and run the SAO AT24 read. And you can see it read the memory chip, DEF CON year 32, maker is 42, and the badge ID is one. Because this is maker 42 and badge ID one, we know how to read that custom data and so we got a length of 12 bytes, which was hello world. Next, we'll program our memory chip using the life format. And you can see it updated the memory chip. And now when we do a read, you can see the add-on's name is Blinky. And that add-on also has NeoPixel lights, which has 16 LEDs. And the order of the lights are green, red, and blue. So a badge would now know how to control those LEDs using GPIO1. On the left, you can see the JavaScript that read that memory chip, but rather than walk through each line of code, let's look at the key functions for the AT24C32. First, we require I squared C, and then we load the AT24C32JS file. Next, we call init, passing it the I2C and the 0x50 address where we expect the device to be found. If the device is found, we get back a true, otherwise we get back a false. You can also call init with just I squared C, and that will scan for the device, and then you can use get RW address to get back the address where the device was found. Read byte will read one byte of memory at the specified address. Read bytes will return an array of memory starting at the specified address. Read string will read the memory and return it as an ASCII string. 
write byte stores the data at the memory address specified. And finally, write bytes stores an array at the memory specified. Next, let's look at the MCP23017. This chip allows the badge to control 16 pins of GPIO on your add-on. You can use it for both output, like blinking LEDs, or input. I'll start by running the SAO MCP out demo. And this app uses six pins of GPIO to blink LEDs. Next, I'll run the matrix demo. And the matrix demo uses eight pins of GPIO, four for the row and four for the column, to determine which button is pressed. Whenever one of our row pins detects a signal, an interrupt is fired. And here you can see that interrupt was on GPIO pin eight. The interrupt pin turns on until our code reads the value. And as we scan the columns, you can see the column lights turn on as well. Watch those interrupt and column lights as I press S10. While using the switches is interesting, my guess is that most add-ons will use this chip to drive a bunch of LEDs. On the left is the code for the matrix switches, but let's look at the key functions. We require I squared C, and then we do a load for MCP23017.js. Next, we call init, passing it I to C in the address of 0x20, where the device is found. This will return a true if the device is found and a false otherwise. If you don't pass 20, it will scan for the address and you can use get rw address to get that address. After you've called init, you should call reset to put the chip in a well-known state and then call pin mode passing the pin. The pin is a number between zero and 15 and then the mode such as output, input or input with pull-up resistor. Call digital read passing the pin and you'll get a true if it has 3.3 volts or false if it's ground. Digital write takes a pin and a value true or false, which will set an output pin to either 3.3 or ground. Call setup interrupt pin passing the pin and whether to trigger the interrupt on low, high, or a change of value. If you want to remove the interrupt, call clear interrupt pin passing just the pin number. To see which pin triggered an interrupt, call get last interrupt pin. This will return negative one if no interrupt was triggered. And finally, call get captured interrupt value to get a 16-bit value with the state of all the pins at the time of the interrupt. Next, we'll look at addressable LEDs known as dot star, APA102, and the cheaper SK9822. These lights have four wires, Ground connects to our ground. The pin labeled five volts seems to work fine on 3.3 volts. The data in pin is the same as user one, which connects to flipper pin two, A7. The clock in pin goes to user two, which goes to flipper pin five, B3. We'll run SAO SK9822. And you can see the lights changing colors. On the left is the code that blinked our lights. Let's look at the key functions on the right. You'll recall our lights did not use the I squared C interface, but they use that user one and user two pin, also known as GPIO one and GPIO two. So for JavaScript to quickly clock in the data, we do a require of SPI. Next, we load the SK9822 underscore SPIJS file, and then we call init passing it SPI. Notice the SPI protocol doesn't have any addresses. We call write start to begin our write sequence. And then for each LED, we call write color, passing it the red, green, blue, and intensity values. Red, green, and blue are a value between zero and 255 and intensity is the value between zero and 31. 31 is the brighter intensity. The lights update as soon as you make the call. And then you call write stop, passing a value of zero to signal that you're done writing to the lights. 
Next, we have the NeoPixel and WS2812B addressable LEDs. Again, we have the ground pin, and the pin labeled 5 volts can go to 3.3, and then the data in can either go to that user 1, pin 2 on the flipper 0, or you can use pin 5 on the flipper 0, which is the user 2 bottom pin on the SAO. We'll run the SAO WS2812B, and this sample just sets the first seven LED colors. And then here I've connected pins two and five to those user one and user two pins on the interactive SAO for the DC32 badge. I set user one function to LED, and the LED type is WS2812. And then for user 2, I selected LED and a WS2812. We'll rerun the SAO WS2812B app, and you can see the lights were set to different colors. On the left, you can see the WS2812 app, and on the right are the key functions. I haven't submitted this module to Momentum Firmware yet, so the names may change, and the function signatures may change as well. Setup takes an object with the pin set to the flipper pin number or the flipper pin name, such as PB3. And then the count is a total number of LEDs connected to that pin. Next, set takes the LED index starting at zero, along with the values of the red, green, and blue. Note that set just updates some memory. It doesn't actually update the lights. And then finally, call update to update the lights with whatever's been set. This next demo is just GPIO. So for user 1, we set it to LED, and we set our LED type to discrete. This is just an LED that turns on when it has power. For user 2, we chose button, and we set our button signal to low. We'll run SAO GPIO, and you can see that LED blinking and it keeps printing false, and when I click the button, it prints true. On the left is the code that blinked the LED and displayed the button values, and on the right is the key functions. I covered GPIO in detail a few weeks ago, but I'll cover it briefly again here. We require event underscore loop, and then we require GPIO. Be sure to require event underscore loop first or you'll get an error. Next, we use get, passing it the pin, which can either be the pin number or the pin name, like PA7. Then we initialize the pin for output, if it's an LED, or for input, if it's a switch. If you want to hear about all the options, watch my video from a few weeks ago. Write a true to turn the pin to 3.3 volts, or a false to make it go to ground. And then finally, read returns a Boolean, True if the pin is high or false if the pin is low. Thanks for watching the video. Hopefully now you know how your Flipper Zero can integrate with all kinds of badge add-ons. If you're using an AT Tiny in your badge add-on, I encourage you to watch my other video as well. Also, please take a moment to like and subscribe. That really helps me out. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below or reach out to me on Discord.